speaking today, we have Rebecca Carter. Rebecca is a recent graduate from the UCLA School of Law. And during the 2019-2020 academic year, Rebecca was a visiting student at the Northwestern Pritzker School of Law. At UCLA, Rebecca specialized in the Critical Race Studies program. Rebecca is dedicated to serving communities of color and disinvested communities on various social justice issues through a critical race theory lens. Rebecca worked with the Chicago Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights this summer through the Public Interest Law Initiative. She is continuing her work this fall as a postgraduate fellow where she focuses on voting rights and equitable community development and housing. Rebecca will be joining Winston and Strong Chicago office next year as a litigation associate. We're also excited to have Ami Gandhi here with us today. Ami is the senior counsel of the Chicago Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights and works to reduce barriers to voting and improve civic participation, especially in communities of color and low income communities. Ami's experience includes leading statewide voter protection for the 2016 and 2018 elections, partnering with community members in the criminal justice system to expand voter access, advocating for communities of color during Illinois redistricting, and advising local election boards as they implemented the first Hindi ballots in the country. She previously worked as the executive director of the South Asian American Policy and Research Institute, also known as SAPRI, where she led initiatives in voting rights, immigrants' rights, and other civil rights and racial justice issues. Prior to her work at SAPRI, Ami worked as the legal director of Asian Americans Advancing Justice Chicago and as a commercial litigation attorney at Freeborn and Peters LLP. Ami serves on the board of Common Cause Illinois and the American Civil Liberties Union of Illinois. She participates in the law and politics think tank with incarcerated community members at Stateville's Correctional Center. Ami also serves on the Language Access Committee of the Illinois Supreme Court Access to Justice Commission and the Stakeholder Advisory Board of the South Asian Healthy Lifestyle Initiative at Northwestern. Ami co-chaired Mayor Lori Lightfoot's Good Governance Committee, and she also serves on Governor J.B. Pritzker's Transition Committee on Equality, Equity, and Opportunity. If you can find your hand clap emojis, please join me in giving Ami and Rebecca a warm Zoom welcome. Um, and I'll hand the floor over to you guys. Nice. So thank you both so much for being here. I am going to spot, I should be able to spotlight both of you. There we go. Um, and so I will be asking some questions and we'll have some really great conversation and you can raise your blue hands if you have any questions. Um, so the first question is, can you tell us a little bit about what the Chicago Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights does and how did you get interested in this area of law? Yeah, definitely. Thank you again for having us here today. Just really excited to speak with all of you and answer any questions that you have. Um, so to answer your first question, Chicago Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights is a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization of both civil rights lawyers and advocates that are really committed to securing racial equity and economic opportunity for all and has been doing so since 1969. Um, in all of the practice areas, the organization uses a community lawyering approach, which really serves to center the objectives of the communities that we work with. And the way we go about doing that is building relationships um, with community partners and who have even stronger ties with the communities we're hoping to serve. Um, so we can really understand what their needs are and also how we can help um, be a vehicle to achieve and meet the goals of those needs. Um, with the voting rights practice area in particular, we're focused on eliminating barriers to both voting and other forms of civic participation, um, but particularly for communities of color and in low income communities. And a lot of this comes into play year round, um, especially, but also during the election season and through our protection, election protection program. Um, and so it's through that program that we're also able to use that community lawyering approach and receiving input from community members about where we might want to send out volunteers to um, certain polling places or certain areas um, where we're anticipating um, some issues might arise. Uh, but it's just important to use this approach as well. And I think CLC does a great job of using this approach to really work with those community partners to both understand the issues, but also to work through what are the best strategies for um, addressing certain things in a particular neighborhood or area. Thank you so much. Um, and could you talk to us a little bit about the history of voting rights in Chicago and specifically as that's where the University of Chicago is located? Sure, I'll start us off and Rebecca, I welcome you to chime in as well. And hello again, everyone. I'm Ami with Chicago Lawyers Committee. Thank you so much for having me. 
And actually, we have another colleague also on this call, Michael Ortega. We have the chance to work with him because of his work at National Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights. And so, Michael, I also welcome you if you wanted to chime in about anything. It's been great to get a chance to work with you a little bit. And we have seen that the issues affecting Chicago and Illinois voters are similar to the patterns that we see in other locations as well and throughout our country's history where it's evident that the voting system was set up specifically to exclude some parts of the electorate. And that was certainly the case historically and a lot of us are familiar with tactics and laws like poll taxes and literacy tests and other practices that we would find to be totally objectionable as we should. And a lot of times the, the issues that we see are maybe not as blatantly entrenched in racism as some of those past pr practices have been, but still definitely can have racist effects. And so we do hear from many voters of color and low income community members, including on the South side of Chicago, as well as other areas. We talk to a lot of community members who have been part of the criminal legal system, who have questions about their voting rights or how to exercise their voting rights. And, you know, even by, even through a process that might sound as straightforward and bureaucratic as voter registration, it's important to remember that while that can be a system that's seamless for some people um, in their experience in registering to vote online or when they got their driver's license or some other step that might have been matter of fact and straightforward for some community members, it can be a roadblock for others. And uh, voter registration itself in Illinois and in Chicago has a history of uh, being instituted to not just keep information organized and to have an election system with integrity, those are important goals, but the way that the registration systems have been crafted have been to uh, exclude formerly enslaved community members in some parts of the country, to exclude immigrant citizens as well, to exclude people who don't own land or low income community members or low wealth community members in various parts of the country. And so when we, uh, we still have vestiges of those registration systems and um, other bureaucratic hoops that we have to go through to vote um, even today. And those are sometimes the kinds of issues that people call us about. They're, they might simply be um, trying to register to vote or find their polling place and, and have an issue with that. Issues like long lines or polling place closures that are unanticipated or un, um, you know, not really announced clearly. Those issues have come up on the South side as well. And I certainly don't mean to paint an only negative picture in terms of the disenfranchisement that we um, have, have seen and that's part of the history uh, in Chicago. And um, there is also a lot of excitement that people have had, sometimes depending on who's on the ballot. And that can really energize um, communities, including communities of color, including any of us. You know, how invested we feel in an election can very much depend on who's on the ballot and how much of a choice we think we, we have, a meaningful choice. And I do want to mention as well that one of the reasons for a lot of expanded voter access in Illinois and Chicago in recent years is because of our dark history because people didn't trust our elections. We were kind of, you know, the poster child for corrupt elections or elections with vote buying or voter intimidation. And um, we still see some of those problems every election, unfortunately, but of course it's much less than in our, in our history. And we have seen that government leaders in Illinois from both parties actually have been really interested in trying to get away from the past reputation of how elections were perceived in Illinois and Chicago and institute innovations and modernizations and expanded access and more equitable practices because they want to be seen as, you know, this is the way forward. We want to be 
a record setting state for how fair our election system is, how many different ways people can register or participate instead of um, like a laughing stock of the country. So that's a little bit of context to know too, as far as why sometimes our state and local election authorities do work so hard to, um, to try to have good practices to try to get away from some of the negative past reputation. Great, thank you. you. You touched on this a little bit in talking about the communities that are served um, both by the CLCCR and just impacted by voting rights in general. Talk a little bit more about what communities are most impacted by issues related to voting rights and voting access. Yeah, certainly. Um, so I'll talk a little bit more about our election protection program, but I just want to highlight it here because it's through this program every year, multiple times a year that we're basically able to track um, issues that arise in different communities and to see if there's any trends that are occurring. Um, but voting rights issues arise in a number of ways that um, Ami just touched on. There's a very clear purposeful history of disenfranchisement um, throughout the United States. I just want to plug Justice Ginsburg's dissent in Shelby County versus Holder as just a great example, in my opinion, of uh, providing some analysis on how these different barriers have adapted over time to harm specific communities. So more directly to your question, uh, some of the communities that we see impacted by a lot of these issues include low income communities, black and brown communities, communities of color um, more generally, and also those voters in the criminal legal system. So for example, um, prison-based gerrymandering is such a mechanism that harms both low income communities and also black and brown communities by essentially counting incarcerated community members um, where the prison or jail is located instead of where their home is. Um, so for example, um, just close to home, 60% of incarcerated community members in Illinois prisons are from Chicago, but over 90% of those persons are then in institutions outside of the county. And that serves to basically take away the voting power of those communities where those incarcerated community members are originally from and then serves on the other hand to bolster the voting power of those communities where the prisons are located. We also see uh, community members, disabled community members and language access issues arising um, in terms of access to voting. Both there's physical barriers um, in terms of getting into the polling place and that's something that people can volunteer to kind of help with during the election season or things that people might call in to report to us um, during a particular election. Um, navigating through the actual polling place is another issue. And then also in terms of language access that I think has become increasingly popular. I know that I've, I've learned a lot more about it in my past year at Chicago Lawyers Committee. Um, but ensuring that voters are able to both understand the voting instructions um, and also able to understand the materials that are on the ballot in a language that they know that they're comfortable with. Um, so people can really feel confident in making an informed decision. So as Ami mentioned, there's several issues and I know we'll go into them further, but there's a long history of all of these communities um, being impacted by various barriers that arise in some old ways, some new ways, um, throughout our history into the present day. Thank you. And in point in getting to other things later, can you speak to the current election and what the specific and or most pressing issues relating to voting rights are for this upcoming election in November? I'll be happy to start off and would welcome Rebecca to chime in as well. We have seen in our voter protection work in Illinois and also increasingly in Indiana that there are a lot of unique issues due to the COVID pandemic that voters are facing either for the first time or that are an increased or more urgent concern for voters during this election compared to usual. Um, of course, we've seen the expanded 
use uh, and reliance upon vote by mail in this election, which means that actually our election is already going on, even though it's not November yet and we're, we are well underway into the election. Thankfully, Illinois has a history of, a long history of the use of vote by mail and our election authorities have significant experience with it. So it's still, you know, a much larger volume of ballots coming in that way and a lot of important details that had to be worked out already and that still have to be worked out about how to administer that system fairly when it's on such used on such a massive scale for community members who do not want to vote in person. But we're not starting from scratch in Illinois. Um, so that's, that's important to remember. There have been uh, on the local and national level, a number of myths circulating about the risk of voter fraud when it comes to expanded vote by mail. And, you know, we want to reiterate that it's really important to look at the facts here and um, the facts just do not support the speculations or myths about widespread voter fraud, even when we have an uptick in vote by mail. And in fact, vote by mail for many community members is going to be the safest, healthiest, preferable option. And so um, we want that right to be as robust as possible for anyone who might need to participate that way. In-person voter access is still extremely important though, especially in communities of color. We talk to many community members who either cannot vote by mail because of um, how permanent of an address they have or how stable their housing situation is, or it could be for a variety of other reasons. And those kinds of issues definitely affect black communities and communities of color differently than the population at large. So we have insisted that there also absolutely has to be some kind of in-person voter access for those who need that option, for those who feel more comfortable with that option. Um, vote by mail is not, that procedure is not gonna be familiar or um, accessible for everyone. And so um, er, a lot of people are using early voting this time around in Illinois and Indiana. And we do encourage that if people are looking for an in-person voting option and if early voting is feasible, it might be a smoother experience than waiting until election day. Um, but just as the, the theme of what I've been saying, it's still important to have all available options. Just because someone maybe hadn't made their choice about who to vote for until election day doesn't mean they did anything wrong and they shouldn't be punished for that. They still, of course, um, deserve to have access to voting on election day. And so that will also be available for voters in Illinois and Indiana. These are not perfect systems for a variety of reasons. Um, in Illinois, in the March primary election, Rebecca was a part of, of that voter protection effort as well. There were a lot of polling places that closed or changed at the last minute, sometimes with no notice to voters because either shortage of workers there or because of um, the tenant, the, excuse me, the landlords or the property owners deciding they didn't want the risk of people, voters coming in, members of the public coming in. In COVID, you know, a lot of the analysis has changed, but uh, we think that the election authorities had longer time to plan for the November election, and we would certainly be there to advocate for any voters who are needing fair access to in-person voting. In Indiana, there even, aside from COVID related changes, there has been a significant reduction in the number of polling places in many parts of Indiana and those um, changes and reduced access has, have definitely hit communities of color harder and the, the kind of long lines and other issues that we see in places like Marion County, Indiana, um, which is home to Indianapolis and um, you know, significant black communities and other communities of color. The, reduction in polling places has certainly played out in a way that's been problematic for people there. Um, we are also very keenly concerned about ongoing voter access issues affecting community members in the criminal legal system. Every election we conduct a voter protection program at Cook County Jail and we will be doing that again this election. We would encourage anyone to contact us um, actually, they would need to contact us pretty much today or tomorrow if they're interested in getting involved in that program. 
And it's been really one of the great privileges for me in this work to get to be involved with our nonpartisan voter protection work in Cook County Jail. We have certainly, so this is uh, community members who are in pretrial detention who have been accused of a crime and who are awaiting trial have not been convicted. Most of the population there are community members who have the financial inability to pay bail. And so they still have their voting rights on paper, but in a practical sense are often not able to exercise their voting rights. So thanks to the hard work of community leaders, great organizations like Chicago Votes, for example, um, there have been improvements to voter access in the jail in recent elections. And there was actually an in-person polling place at Cook County Jail in multiple different divisions in the March primary election. And that's gonna look different for this upcoming election, but uh, due to COVID and due to the unique public health concerns in correctional institutions. But the community members have insisted there still needs to be in-person voter access in the jail for those who want to participate that way. And so um, these next couple weekends, we're, we're gonna be there with a small team of law students and attorneys to um, be a resource and to uh, be there to advocate for voters when needed because some of the aspects of the system like same day registration and looking up your voter registration, getting assistance like language or disability type assistance, those kind of processes are more straightforward in polling places outside of the jail as compared to in the limited jail environment. So that's one of our concerns. That's one of the problems that we look out for. Um, there's also been a robust effort in Illinois to have stronger protections for community members who have been convicted, who have a criminal record, but who um, have completed their sentence. So they have a past criminal record. And in Illinois, community members who have a past criminal record but who have completed their sentence are immediately eligible to reclaim their voting rights, but they do have to take affirmative steps to do that. They have to register or re-register because they would have been taken off of the voter rolls while serving a sentence. And there's a huge information gap, and I would even say there's a lot of misinformation out there where community members are told upon leaving prison, they're even sometimes told by government officials or by others that you're, you don't have the right to vote anymore, you're gonna get in trouble if you do that. And so we don't have any kind of lifetime ban like that in Illinois, but that's still the common thinking that we have such a prohibition. And so thanks to leadership by incarcerated and returning community members, there's a program in Illinois that's in the early stages of implementation called Civics in Prison. And um, incarcerated and returning community members wrote and passed a law last year, and it was a real honor to be able to provide legal help um, during this legislative process. And they wrote and passed the Civics in Prison law, which requires in-person peer-led civics workshops for community members who are in Illinois state prisons who are nearing the end of their sentence and would soon be eligible to reclaim their voting rights. So it talks through not just how to register to vote and what some of the rules are, but probably more importantly, um, has really envisions a peer-led discussion about why is it exciting to vote? Why is it meaningful to have your right to vote restored? And um, I learned pretty quickly from my time going into Stateville prison where we've been really fortunate to collaborate with community members there on some of our voting rights policy work, I learned pretty quickly that they were not really looking for um, me to come in there or um, a, an attorney or a law school professor or others from the outside to necessarily come in and teach that kind of workshop. So we pr have provided some legal assistance and technical assistance here and there, but they really, thought that this civics workshop is gonna be most effective if conducted by someone in their shoes. And um, when it comes to discussing current events or why voting matters, they just really felt like this is gonna be more effective if it's someone in that life situation and as opposed to a preachy type of message. And so that's been um, a really helpful insight that uh, I've appreciated learning from. And civics in prison is in the early stages of implementation now in Illinois. It has not been easy due to COVID. Um, none of this work has been. So 
it's not ideal in terms of where we are and some of the real life applications of these laws that um, are you know, really strong in a theoretical sense, but in real implementation, especially during the pandemic can be a, a whole different challenge. Yeah, I just wanna add, um, I mean, Ami touched on a lot of the pressing issues, but I just wanted to add more generally that, you know, with many things, COVID-19 has exacerbated a lot of the inequities that already exist um, and have combined, you know, just to force to the spotlight a lot of the issues that are going on. And so that's true for voting as well. So it was previously, you know, a barrier for voters to have to face two, three, four, 10 hour lines um, waiting. But now you add in the fact that people need to be socially distanced, um, you know, the guidance on masks or not wearing masks, uh, you know, the guidance on whether the disease is transmitted through the air. All of these things are also now going to combine in this moment where we are getting ready for an election. Some people are already out voting um, and that could serve as a barrier to folks. So I think um, just as we get closer to the election, that will also be an issue. I think we saw some of those combined issues previously throughout the elections this year, and there might be new combinations potentially, um, but to just be cognizant of the fact that COVID-19 will have its impact on the election and will combine with previous barriers um, to potentially raise other issues. So that's why it's important to just be aware and cognizant of that. And then also related to why, um, you know, it's been important to educate people or inform people that there are multiple safe ways to vote. I think another issue that I'm seeing um, just anecdotally is just concern about the integrity of the elections. Um, and Ami perfectly touched on the issues of voter fraud historically, but how there's virtually no voter fraud now. Um, but just ensuring folks that, you know, it is safe for them to cast their ballot by mail, or if they are feeling iffy about that for whatever reason, that they're also safe in-person voting options. So um, I think what I really appreciated with CLC and some of the community partners that we've worked with, instead of discrediting folks for telling them, you know, this isn't a problem at all, don't worry about it, they've also provided other avenues available to folks to be able to cast their vote safely, because the reality is not everyone will feel comfortable um, casting a a, vote, a ballot by mail um, and some of the recent news regarding the post office. Personally, I, I think that's understandable. So uh, again, just the integrity of the elections, the options available to folks and really just being on the forefront, trying to inform folks ahead of time, I think has been an issue, but something that we're proactively trying to address by providing that education up front. Thank you. I think like, all of these are like leading to each other so nicely. <laughs> um, but I was wondering if you could talk about how students or anyone can get involved in maybe helping with this education process or just impacting voting rights in a positive way um, and talking a little bit about this kind of how it is nonpartisan and how voting rights is a nonpartisan issue and everyone needs to vote regardless of who it is you're voting for. Um, if you could talk a little bit about that and how we can all get involved. Sure, I'm happy to start off. I'm sorry, Rebecca, if I cut you off. I'm happy to start off and invite Rebecca to add as well. Um, first of all, when we get, so we run a voter protection hotline, 866-HOUR-VOTE, and there are companion lines for community members who speak languages other than English. And um, this number works from anywhere in the country. And we, typically are handling the Illinois and Indiana calls live on election day and working with some of the behind the scenes matters before election day. And when people call us, you know, sometimes our questions are really discreet and they almost feel silly for calling in. We're so glad that they do because we think that no question is too small, especially in these confusing times. There could be completely understandable reasons why someone has a question about when or where or how to register or anything else that's on their mind about the voting process. It doesn't mean that they had to have suffered um, some clear instance of racial discrimination in order to warrant calling us. I mean, it's nothing like that. Unfortunately, we do hear about issues of 
voter intimidation, for example, but the more typical calls are about very solvable issues, which is great. And so, you know, helping us get this phone number out in your circles would really help us because we want as many people as possible to feel comfortable calling us for information. We're, again, we're a nonpartisan resource. We feel really good about our ability to answer questions. And so sharing the hotline number is one really important way. And then we do have an election protection volunteer program um, especially aimed at November 3rd, and we'll put in the chat the, the sign up for that. And we've just had an overwhelming interest in that already. Some of you are on our voting rights email list and you are already very familiar with what I'm talking about. The sign up link went out to the public last week. We already have a lot of our different volunteer needs filled, but there, there are still more opportunities to be involved with us. Um, we ha are going to have a call center like we usually do to answer these hotline calls. And don't be, if you have experience and interest and if the call center shifts are full, um, you know, there might be other ways for you to be involved, like experienced voter protection volunteers could help us as a call center captain, for example. Uh, um, if you wanted to talk more about that possibility, if you have experience doing this kind of work before, and if you're a new volunteer and looking for a voter protection opportunity, you'll see an option on our form to be a field volunteer, an on-call field volunteer, where we would train you for our nonpartisan poll watching work. I know that option is not for everyone, um, given your own comfort level or health situation. And so none of this is to, to push you. If it's not a comfortable time to volunteer in person or to volunteer with us, then even getting our hotline number out is something that we would really appreciate. And for people who are involved with a civic organization or a student group, anything along those lines, if you're looking for some social media graphics or other things that you could share with your networks, um, with our hotline number or with other Know Your Rights, type information, we're happy to send that along as well. Yeah, election protection is um, definitely one of a great way that you can help out. But just a few other small examples, um, volunteering as an election judge, for example, this past year has been um, one of the things a lot of jurisdictions have been pushing for folks to come out and help. I believe the latest numbers, there was a lot of um, outreach for the November election, at least here in Chicago. but. I'm still sure there's opportunities to be a standby judge if they have filled all of those um, positions because things do happen last minute. And then um, just another thing, it's not necessarily related to uh, voting rights more broadly, but I do think informing yourself of what's on your ballot and being able to make informed decisions and helping others to um, make informed decisions, not to choose for them, but uh, there's lots of resources out there that provide evaluations of judges, for example. Um, I know the first time I voted, I was overwhelmed because there was a lot more on there than I understood. And just uh, over the years, knowing that there's resources out there to explain what a water reclamation district is, for example, um, has been helpful for me. So I, I don't think it's wrong to, to not know those things. I unfortunately did not have the best civics education in high school. And so I think it's okay to share that information um, with others or to learn it for yourself. And then um, my last uh, suggestion just for helping with voting rights at large is to just have a plan for how you plan to vote. Um, so having an initial plan and maybe a backup plan, um, I know that materials will be or there's a tracking process if you're voting by mail, for example. Um, but if something happens, you know, having a backup plan um, for that, whether it's early voting or voting in person on election day, just so you can be prepared um, and being able to use your voice in this way. Thank you both so much. So I am going to now open it up to any questions we might have from our lovely attendees. Um, if you have any questions for Ami or Rebecca about voting rights, um, about how to get involved, even about legal education, how Rebecca got to where she is. She's a recent grad, <laughs> um, just sat for the bar last week. <laughs> any questions from the audience?
Well, I can actually just touch on that really briefly because I know I didn't at the beginning. Um, so as uh, James mentioned, I graduated from UCLA. Um, I specialized in the critical race theory program there, which is, has become a hot topic in the news recently. Um, but that program really focuses on how race and law shape one another. And that was the major reason why I went to UCLA, but also why I wanted to go to law school um, based on my own personal um, interactions with the law from a young age as a teen parent. And then that experience, as well as the um, murder of Trayvon Martin and the subsequent uh, trial that happened with George Zimmerman were some of the most pivotal moments in my life that really made me want to go to law school and to be a civil rights lawyer and to just do that good work that I think is so important and crucial for our country. Um, so those were my motivations for going to law school. And then I was so fortunate to be able to visit at Northwestern for my last year because it led me to being able to extern full time at Chicago Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights. I just want to plug that, you know, if you're in law school, please seek out externship opportunities if you can, because that was by far some of the most valuable work that I did in all my time in law school. Um, it was the first opportunity that I had on a long term basis to do this kind of work, to do civil rights work, to work with community members um, directly and you know, various community organizations. So I cannot emphasize enough how valuable the externship experience is. And then it just led to other great opportunities with being able to work with CLC during the summer and now even after the bar exam. Um, so I'm a big fan of externships and always happy to talk with anyone further about that experience or if they're thinking of doing something similar for themselves. Thank you. Any questions for our presenters before I just start asking questions? Um, I've got one in the chat. Thank you so much for the great information. Any thoughts either of you would like to share about the Amy Coney Barrett hearings? Um, I will just say, again, I want to emphasize Chicago Lawyers Committee obviously is a nonpartisan organization. Speaking for myself personally, I have not been engaged with the hearings that much um, over the past few weeks. I just took the bar exam, so that was the big uh, central focus of my life for the past six months or so going on. <laughs> There's a lot going on in the news right now. Um, so for me, as a means of self-care and just focusing on what I really am passionate about and care about, I've, I've chosen not to engage with the hearings that much. Thanks, Rebecca, for sharing that. That's actually helpful and refreshing to hear your take on it, um, how it's been like for you to take this in when there's so much that you've been tackling. Um, I just want to back up a, a bit to mention, it's probably very obvious, but we're so, so fortunate to have Rebecca on our team. And um, yeah, so I just appreciate her jumping in right after completing the bar exam and helping us ramp up for the election and joining us for this conversation today. And I think there's something special about getting to work with law students who, you know, any law students who we get to partner with, but especially when it's during the school year or when it's towards the end of their law school career, there's just a lot that they can be involved with in our organization in a very hands-on way and be part of our staff, just like I or any other staff member would be um, and be included in that. And that's uh, been really wonderful to be able to work with Rebecca in that way. And we do have opportunities through the PILI program for both PILI internships and PILI fellowships with our organization in case that's something that any of you law students are ever interested or considering. Um, you'll see our name as one of the host organizations through those programs. And so that's one of the ways that we've worked with Rebecca as well as other um, externship and other programs. So I encourage any of you to reach out if you're interested in working with us. Um, Related to the hearing, so I think we, and this is just a bigger picture comment too about other 
things in the news and other recent events because things are so chaotic right now, it, it feels, is that we try to figure out how can we be responsive to voters' concerns that they might have, which relate to some of these events, like understandable concerns they have about intimidation at the polling place or things being so polarized or um, about feeling like their rights are on the line with some of the current discussions and policy decisions. Um, we try to figure out how can we be there for voters and for community members, not just in our voting rights practice area, but also in our other practice areas of education equity and equitable community development and housing, you know, other areas of civil rights and racial equity that are being discussed these days. So we want to be there for voters. We want to be supportive, be zealous advocates. We also do not want to incite panic or um, make people too stressed out if it's something that like we don't want everyone to have to overthink all of the disasters in the news if it's going to put especially like from a voting rights perspective if it's going to put someone in a situation where they're less inclined to participate um, i'm all about us collectively being informed and knowing our rights but we try to walk a fine line about um we don't want to make someone who's already maybe considering or tentative about participation we don't want to deter them from that if there's not a need to do so so when we've been we've been getting questions about what might the conditions be like at the polls because there have been threats by the president and by others about militarization of polling places or federal agents or other conditions and so uh, sometimes where I land on it is that I don't know if those will be threats in Illinois. Um, I, I I don't have a crystal ball or anything like that, but I would hope that people can get educated and then feel comfortable with proceeding with their priorities of how they might want to engage for this election cycle or more generally. Um, you know, one of the cases we are involved with for protecting Indiana voting rights we had a preliminary injunction granted in recent days that would, at the district court level that would have allowed voters votes to count if they were mailed in, if there, were, there was a postmark by November 3rd, and if they were received within several days after the election, because we know with the US Postal Service disruptions and for other reasons, COVID related reasons, um, mail is not very quick right now. And so we received this like thorough, very well reasoned district court preliminary injunction order at, um, that was reversed yesterday, late yesterday by the Seventh Circuit um, in a very brief opinion that felt to us like very out of touch with the concerns of voters and, you know, possibly is going to push voters to risk their health in Indiana where COVID rates are rapidly rising to go vote in person because they feel like vote by mail is less of an option for them, which is an absentee voting is already a limited program in Indiana compared to Illinois or other states. And even then people who have like high risk health situations or other vulnerabilities because of this court decision are going to be put in an even more vulnerable situation of either their vote not being counted or being scared that their vote won't be counted and then potentially risking their health to vote in person. So that's what's on my mind when I think about the hearings going on right now and just some of the um, potential dangers in the courts and how that affects our daily lives and community members' daily lives, people who we care about. Um, so again, as Rebecca said, I wanna echo that we're a nonpartisan organization but we can't help but notice the harm that occurs when there's a disconnect between the judges who have the power to make decisions that affect our daily lives and kind of how uh, familiar they are or how much they care about the real life repercussions of their decisions. Thank you. We've got two more questions in the chat. Uh, the first is what else can people get involved in during years where there isn't a presidential election, thinking about midterm elections and local elections each November? Yeah, so there's definitely um, volunteer opportunities during non-presidential election years. Um, we do have election protection programs for um, local elections and midterm elections as well. So that is an option. And there's also other sorts of volunteer opportunities um, 
where folks both in undergrad um, and law school and grad school can come in, well, not in this COVID-19 setting, but can work with CLC um, to do, you know, a variety of voting rights research tasks, calling different um, jurisdictions, for example, to get details on how they're conducting elections, for example. Um, so there are other opportunities, um, both through the election protection program, but you know, through other tasks as well. I think you touched on our next question already, but if there's anything else, um, the question is, I'm an undergraduate at UChicago, thanks for coming. Um, how can undergrads without formal law experience get involved with election protection efforts? And I think, I mean, this goes for me too, like I'm not a lawyer. <laughs> um, how can us non-lawyer folk get involved? I, I encourage anyone to still take a look at our form that we shared in the chat in case any of our opportunities are a fit for you. Although we primarily recruit legal volunteers, we do have some other volunteers who are part of our team as well, and it works out great. And there are also other fantastic organizations like Common Cause Illinois and Chicago Votes that I encourage you to check out because they are amazing organizations in their own right, conducting important voter engagement work this year. Rebecca did mention that there is an important role for young people and all people to serve as election judges this year if they're comfortable. That's the term for a paid poll work. And I know that Chicago has had an overwhelming interest in election judges who have applied. So if you, you may have already tried that route, but that's something I would consider for Chicago or other jurisdictions as well in case there's still a need, even if they put you on standby. Um, I think it's still really helpful to have that workforce ready to go. So um, when inevitably some people cancel or cannot come in due to health concerns on November 3rd, it's helpful to have a workforce ready uh, for people who are comfortable at the polls. But we, we do hope that we get to work with as many of you as possible on election day. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to plug the University of Chicago also has an initiative, UChi Votes. I think everyone is very aware that everyone getting to the polls this year is really important. Um, and so we want to make sure that student representation and any eligible voter um, affiliated with the University of Chicago votes. Um, we want really good voter turnout. Um, so check out UChi Votes um, if you can. And James, do you have anything to plug, announcements, a question of your own? Um, just certainly. I'll put my email in the chat. And if you guys want to get on the Impact Initiative listserv, I'll be forwarding emails from AMI. I'm on um, the Chicago Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights um, mailing list. And so I'll be sending volunteer opportunities through that. So if you guys would like to learn more, please connect with us. We're connected with the Chicago Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights, and that'll be a way that you can learn more. Well, thank you both so much, AMI and Rebecca. This was fantastic. I love learning about voting rights myself as a non-lawyer. Um, and I think it's just really important and timely. Again, this has been a Diversity Scholar Series event and the first of our election 2020 events. You got an email today outlining every event that we're doing for the election. This is a very important year. Every year is important. Voting is important all the time, always. Vote early and often. <laughs> um, and so that's my plug on voting. Um, and if there are no more questions, James just put his email in the chat. Thank you all so much for coming. Um, and we look forward to seeing you at the next one.